And Imam Al-Qayyim Rahimahullah, he says something very powerful about the way that Adam alayhi salam was created. And he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala did not command the Malaika to prostrate to Adam alayhi salam until after he breathed into it the soul of Adam alayhi salam, the ruh of Adam alayhi salam. You know, that's extremely powerful because basically what Imam Al-Qayyim Rahimahullah says is that the soul is more worthy of being paid attention to than the jasad, than the body. Because before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the soul in Adam alayhi salam, he literally was just that, a lump of flesh. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala venerated it. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses that term, that وَنَفَّقَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathed into him from his spirit. You know, subhanAllah, just a few months ago, I was I heard someone actually saying that that means we all carry Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside of us. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's his ruh, and so we all have the ruh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside of us. But in reality, that is Allah's way of venerating it. The same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Kaaba Baytullah. Okay, a lot of people might you might have believed this growing up in Sunday school, I know I did, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lives inside the black box of the Kaaba. Allah doesn't live inside the Kaaba. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala venerated the Kaaba by calling it Baytullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he calls the naqa, the she camel, naqatullah, it doesn't literally mean Allah's she camel, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala venerating it. So when we think about this, the ruh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah chose to venerate it to that extent, to say, وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ Now I don't want to go into a long discussion about the difference between ruh and nafs, because that's what I was asked to talk about. That is an extremely academic discussion, much difference of opinion, and I guarantee you, you will be lost and I will be lost by the time I finish talking about it. But just quickly, the ruh, the soul, the spirit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us, is something that will continue on for eternity. And you know, you might think to yourself, when did the ruh start? After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it, it's, it's really beautiful that Rasulullah mentioned something in, a, in an authentic hadith from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, that al-arwah junood mujannada, that the souls are like drafted soldiers. Whoever they had an affinity towards previously, they will have an affinity towards in dunya. And whoever they did not incline towards previously, they will not incline towards in dunya. So when you tell someone, I've hated you forever, you might be telling the truth. And if I tell you that I've loved you forever, I loved you in a previous realm, then I'm telling you the truth. And Imam al-Sha'bi rahimahullah, he told his wife, he said, how beautiful it is, is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote your name next to mine 50,000 years before the entire creation. MashaAllah. There's a reason why his name was al-Sha'bi, the popular sheikh, because he knew how to really get people going, mashallah. So that's what he said to his wife. So in reality, even when we come close to each other, when we find love for each other, when we have affinity towards each other, whenever we click, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made that so special that that was before we even got here. And subhanAllah, there is no other nation, no other group of people where you have people that meet each other for the first time and wallahi there is love, there is a true a true love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's like I've seen you before, I've known you before and you might be telling the truth because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the arwah to gather together to love one another in the previous realm and in the future realm also that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the lives of the shuhada, the souls of the shuhada. And Rasulullah opened it to the, to the believers. That in al barza in another realm, although the believers are not alive in dunya, they're not walking around and hanging out at people's house, they don't show up after 40 days and eat biryani with you, but they're alive with each other and they visit each other and they gather together. And subhanAllah, what a beautiful gathering that truly is. Yastabashirun, and they're excited, they're rejoicing for those who have not yet joined them. So that leaves us here. Where do we stand with all of this? Now Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, but this was also the position of, of my teacher, Shaykh Amr al-Asqal rahimahullah ta'ala, who just passed away a few weeks ago. He said that the terms ruh and nafs are actually interchangeable. There's no difference between the two. But as far as the usage is concerned, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the soul and the body coming together, 
in the dunya sense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it as nafs. So it is the ruh, but it's come together. Then, you know, the body and the soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now gives you a choice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a level of free will. Although it's not absolute free will, you do have a level of free will. And for that reason, you have desires. You've got to fight those desires. And we are not like the other creations. And that's why Imam Ibn Tayyir, rahimahullah, he continued a very beautiful statement. He says that the more a person forbids his nafs, forbids his self, from their carnal desires, the closer they become to the malaika, to the angels, although we'll never become angels. And the more he allows himself to indulge in all of his carnal desires, the closer he becomes to being an animal. Think about it. Territory, food, um, what, you know, that's all that animals look for. And we, we see it today. Some human beings literally act like animals. They just pursue their, they pursue their desires the way that an animal would. There's absolutely nothing, nothing holding them back. You know, to the point that Rasulullah said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It's like a dog, always panting, the tongue is always out, you know, just salivating at whatever is in front of it. There is nothing that holds that person back. So that nafs enjoys living like an animal. But the angels enjoy ibadah, they love worship. They gather, not just on Laylatul Qadr, around gatherings like this inshaAllah, where people are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Circles of knowledge. They descend upon people that are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they don't have, they don't have free will. They don't have any choice or desires for food or drink or anything like that. Their enjoyment, their source, their, their, their life comes through ibadah, through pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a person gets to a point where they're literally forbidding themselves from just going after all of those desires, they become angelic without being angels. They get close to being like the malaika. And that's a really beautiful expression. Al-Aswad ibn Salib, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the great tabi'een, said something very powerful. And I want you to think about this, and this is on a whole other level. And that's why the nafs that is close to the angel is like an nafs al-mutma'inna. The soul that is at peace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Aswad ibn Salaf rahimahullah. He said, for me to do two rak'ahs, for me to do two rak'ahs, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is more beloved to me than Jannah and everything in it. Can you imagine that statement? Two rak'ahs is more beloved to me than everything that Jannah has to offer. And why is that? Why would he say something like that? He said, because the two rak'ahs that I do, they're for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Jannah is for me. SubhanAllah, Allahu Akbar. Look at the level of devotion that these people reach. The two rak'ahs is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Jannah is for me. And that's why the greatest, the greatest reward of a person that, that is at that level where they're forbidding their desires, they're just trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're consistently returning the nafs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah refers to it in Surah Al-Fajr. Ya ayyatuha nafsu al-mutma'inna O soul that is at peace, irji'i ila rabbik radiya mardiya Come back to your Lord pleasing and pleased. And some of the scholars said that the reason why they're told pleasing first is because that is truly what, what satisfies them. Pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, getting to that point. Now I know that if we just talk about that high level all night long, and I guarantee you I'm not at that level, and I don't know who would claim to be at that level, that you know we'll just get dis disillusioned and disoriented and think to ourselves, wow, the Sahaba were awesome, the Tabi'in were awesome, and we can't be like them. But where does this all come from? How do we find that balance? Where do we fall into that, that, that spectrum? Many times we think to ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides and misguides and we have nothing to do with that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a burden on you and I. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا أَزَابُوا أَزَابَ اللَّهُ قُرُوبًا For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when they turned away, Allah turned their hearts away. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the nafs, when He tells us about ourselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always places the burden on who? On Him or on us? On us, right? You know, sometimes I'll, I'll, you'll see someone that's totally away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make dua for me. You know, make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes me out of this situation. 
Why don't you start praying? Make dua for me to start praying. Why don't you leave, you know, this haram living? Why don't you abandon this relationship? If Allah wants me to leave it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make me leave it. That's the way some of us think sometimes. Like Allah is gonna force me into that situation and I have absolutely nothing to do with this, right? And, and that's a very dangerous way of thinking. But in reality, it's you and I. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ Verily, he, who, he has succeeded, who has succeeded in purifying himself. SubhanAllah, think about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Surah Al-A'la, Surah Al-Shams, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places the burden of tazkiyah on you and I. You've got to make the effort to consistently purify yourself, to consistently turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to consistently return to your fitwa, to consistently return to the way Allah created you in the first place. Now think about that for a moment. When, you know, the brother recited the very beautiful verses from Surah Al-Hajj, speaking about the fitwa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us all on. We all live and die by that. We go back to the fitwa or we ruin ourselves. And I want you to think about this for a moment. We like to blame the shaitan when we mess up. Right? After Ramadan was over, you can see everybody's Facebook statuses and everybody's Twitter accounts, even though us, you know, uh, great scholars, we were not on Facebook and we're not on Twitter, right? <laughs> but no, we see. And that wasn't a mockery of them, that was a mockery of myself. So I apologize to the Sheikh Yasin, but you know, we see what people are saying. And I know it's, 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 un, it's, it's funny because you'll see someone talk about, I was so good in Ramadan, I wasn't doing anything bad. You know, mashallah, I was able to abandon everything that, you know, I was like one of the Sahaba that after Ramadan, you know, Shaitan got to me. And I'm done. Right? I'm doing exactly the same things I was doing before Ramadan. We blame Shaitan so quick. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, between the angelic self and between the animal like self, is what self? And nafs al At the very least, a soul that blames itself. And nafs and lawana. And shaitan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the speech of shaitan on the day of judgment when shaitan says, Fala talumuni walumu and fusakum. Don't blame me, blame yourselves. Don't blame me, blame yourselves, because you messed up. I didn't do it, I just called you. Illa da'utu kum fastajabtu me, I just called you and you answered. But don't blame me, blame yourselves. And you know what? He's telling the truth. In reality, you can never become anything. You can never reach any level unless you're willing to look in the mirror and say, I need to change this about myself. I messed up. I got myself into this situation. This is my test. This is my trial. The blame is on me. And there's a direct connection between that and the effect that the shaitan can have on you. I want to take you all to a hadith that you, you're all very familiar with, which is the hadith of Al-Isra al Mi'raj, narrated by Abu Hurairah al Bukhari, where Rasulullah mentions that on the night of Al-Isra al Mi'raj, Jibreel alayhi salam presented to him two cups. One of them had milk, laban, one of them had wine, khamar. And the Prophet وسلم, drank from which one? Some, someone actually said the wine. <laughs> He drank from the milk sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what did Jibreel alayhi sallam respond? A very beautiful response. He said, Alhamdulillah illadhi hadaak al fitwa All praise and thanks be to, be to the one who guided you to the fitwa, who guided you to your origin. And what did Jibreel alayhi sallam say to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And by the way, I'm trying to fit a lot of information into a few minutes. So I apologize for jumping from topic to topic, but this is... You know, a lot of a lot of material, there's a lot of depth to this hadith. Jibreel said to the Prophet, if you were to take the khamar, if you were to take the wine, your ummah would have gone astray. Think about that. If you were to choose the wine, your ummah would have gone astray. But you are guided to the fitwa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as a result, the entire ummah of the Prophet naturally inclines towards good, naturally inclines towards things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some things that are just human goodness. How many of you heard about Rachel Corey? Raise your hands if you heard about Rachel Corey. 23 year old, white American, non-Muslim, went to Gaza, stood in front of a bulldozer and was killed. She wasn't Muslim. 
She didn't go there seeking shahada. But there is fitrah. There is a natural inclination there towards goodness, towards justice, towards compassion. And you know, many times we ignore that. And once we ignore that, then shaitan can start attacking us with all these different things. 